Welcome to today's Research Spotlight Talk. My name is Megan Sullivan. I'm a PhD candidate at the Yale School of Environment, and I am the Research Spotlight Assistant for the Peabody Museum. And this is our Research Spotlight series. This is the graduate, the Peabody's Graduate Student Speaker Series, um, and we spotlight different graduate students who do their research in connection with the museum's collections. Just a few things to note today before we start the talk. Um, the chat function for this webinar has been disabled. So if you would please use the Q&A box to submit your questions, we'd really appreciate it. Um, you can submit questions at any time during the webinar. So as soon as you think of one, please feel free to type it into the box and um, we'll make sure to receive all of them. We typically do receive many more questions than our presenters have time to answer. So we do apologize in advance if we're not able to get to your question today. And finally, our program is being live captioned. So you can turn on the captioning in the menu. It's usually in the bottom right of your Zoom window. And so on to our speaker for today, we have uh, Nicolas Mangiardino Koch speaking for us. Nicolas is an evolutionary biologist who is interested in the processes that drive the diversification of living organisms. His work focuses on the exploration of what underlies evolutionary processes and on phylogenetic trees, which depict the relationships among species. His talk today will explore how sea urchins and sand dollars have developed and diversified. And with that, I will pass it off to Nicolas for his talk. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for that introduction. Um, let me share my screen with all of you. Um, and if you don't see that, please let me know. Um, but uh, otherwise, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, us today. And we're going to explore a little bit the origins of the sand dollars and what this amazing group of organisms can teach us about the creative power of nature. And as evolutionary biologists, we're uh, interested in understanding the processes that drive uh, the biodiversification, that sustain the outstanding number of species and the diversity of forms and colors that they exhibit, but really understanding the mechanisms that, that sort of drove this process of biodiversification and that maintain the number of species alive today. Uh, what we need to first explore are the evolutionary relationships among all of these forms. And the way we do that is through the use of phylogenetic trees, such as the one that I'm showing you here uh, in the center of this slide. And phylogenetic trees, such as this one, uh, are showing what, what's showing here is the interrelationships of all of these organisms. That's an, an evolutionary process that started out a long time ago by a single lineage. Um, and whenever two of those, whenever those branches split, that means an event of, of, of splitting of those lineages and the subsequent evolutionary history of each of those independent of each other, leading up to the modern forms that are present in the periphery of that circular phylogeny. And these phylogenetic trees not only tell us a lot about the evolutionary relationships across different lineages, such that embedded within this tree structure is, not, is, is information that tells us, for example, that arthropods, such as this crab and polychaete worms, share a common ancestor when the branches leading to them coalesce, which is shown uh, highlighted here with this yellow dot. And that the common ancestor shared by those two forms is closer in time to us. They're more closely re related than, for example, any of them are to this coral here on the top, which uh, their last common ancestor is highlighted here in green. This green node here necessarily precedes the origin of this other yellow node here. And that means that arthropods and polychaete worms, for example, are more closely related to uh, each other than they are either one of them is to coral. So that's the way phylogenetic trees are read. They also contain a lot of information about the degree of divergence between different life forms, which we can express, for example, as the amount of time that has passed since two or more lineages shared a common ancestor, such that, for example, if we focus on two different groups that are shown here, the deuterostomes, which are those four forms highlighted here in blue on the right, and we compare that to the three lineages of mollusks that we have here, a group that includes uh, bivalves, such as clams and oysters, for example, and snails and other life forms. If we look at their last common ancestors, we 
we uh, automatically see that the deuterostones are a much more ancient group than the mollusks. Their last common ancestor happens deeper within the structure of the tree. And that means that their main branches, their main lineages have been evolving independently of each other for much longer. And phylogenetic trees also serve another purpose, which is they're the main way in which we can explore evolutionary processes. For example, those processes that led to the assembly of the morphology that we see uh, characterizing each of these different life forms. So for example, it is only after we know the relationships of all of these forms that we can hypothesize, for example, that the unique fivefold symmetry uh, that's shared uh, uh, by all echinoderms, which are shown represented here by this starfish and this stocked echinoderm known as a crinoid, but that's characteristic, for example, of sea urchins and sand dollars, like we're going to see later, that fivefold symmetry likely arose only once and all of these forms simply inherited that trait. While other characteristics of these organisms, such as the presence of a skeleton that encloses the soft parts of both uh, bivalves and brachiopods, which are those two forms here, shown here, uh, that although it might look, they, both of those skeletons might look very similar and both of them are composed of two opposing valves, it is highly likely that given the relationship between those two forms and all the other closely related uh, lineages that are shown here, that, that those traits evolved independently in the lineages that gave rise to those uh, forms, and that they represent uh, a case of what we know as evolutionary convergence. Now, another interesting aspect of phylogeny is that, is that they're the main basis for which we classify biodiversity. And sometimes that classification of biodiversity that's proposed by phylogenetic trees conflicts to some degree with our traditional or intuitive approaches to classify biodiversity. And an example of this we can see in the squamates. And if we were to, to be confronted with those six species that are shown there uh, at the top of this tree, then we would sort of be uh, drawn to intuitively group those three forms on the left and give them the name of lizards. And those three forms on the right, we will likely call them snakes. And the problem with this is that although the snakes do represent a natural biological entity in the sense that it, it's a group that's formed by all the, the descendants of a living, uh, of they are all the descend, living descendants of a common ancestor, which is the node here at the base of this green subtree where all of those three branches coalesce. The lizards do not fulfill those requirements to be considered a natural biological entity. They're just whatever is left out of the squamates after we remove the snakes. And beyond, and we see this across the tree of life in many different groups. We see them in the fact that birds are nested within reptiles and for reptiles to be a natural classification, then it should include bird, birds as well. We see that in the fact that fishes should likely also include the land vertebrates. But beyond just being interesting cases of conflict, of lack of congruence between our intuition and phylogenetic approaches to classification, what these examples are teaching us is that there's these brief intervals of time that are characterized by very fast morphological evolution, resulting in the origin of entirely new body plants that are so distinct that we naturally assign them a different name. We refer to them using a different common name. So in all of these cases, something, for example, that looked more or less like a reptile went and underwent this rapid, a, a rapid um, event of morphological evolution and came out with birds, with uh, sorry, with all the traits that we associate with birds, such as feathers and beaks and a lack of teeth and flying and all of these other capabilities that are intrinsic to birds. And today we're going to focus on one more of these cases of dramatic innovation of origin of an entire new body plan. And that is the case of the sand dollars. And I hope that you're all to some extent familiar with these organisms, they're uh, sea urchins. Uh, so a lot of people do not know this, but sand dollars are in fact a member of sea urchins, just uh, like all of these other sort of more typical forms that we associate with the word sea urchin, that, which are globose, circular, spiky marine invertebrates. Sand dollars are nested within that group, and therefore uh, the sand dollars are sea urchins in the same sense as birds are reptiles. But they clearly have a number of features that are entirely unique to them. They're extremely flattened. Many of them have holes running through their skeletons. 
they have miniaturized all of their spines so that we don't really see them there anymore. And for a long time, understanding exactly the process that led to this unique morphological evolution, the origin of this entirely new body plan was somewhat uncertain. And we're going to focus on the effort that I made throughout my dissertation to try and understand this process a little bit better by focusing first on, on, on explaining and addressing the phylogenetic relationships between sand dollars and other main lineages of sea urchins. Um, and once we have constrained the phylogenetic relationships among all of these forms, the, the phylogenetic history that underlied their evolutionary uh, history, then we're going to narrow down into the factors that might have likely drove their unique morphological evolution and also try to understand better when in time, when in geological time, they, did they first come into being, did they first originate it. And for that, we're going to focus on, um, and I focus throughout my dissertation on gathering genomic sequences for all major lineages of sea urchins. So based on recent developments of major, um, given, that gave us the capacity to sequence major large scale amounts of DNA material from all of these organisms. I focused on gathering massive data sets of DNA data, molecular data, and comparing those sequences to try and, and infer from them the underlying phylogenetic history of these forms. And what these genome scale phylogenies have shown to us is that if we focus on the group that includes the sand dollars, as well as many other close relatives, we see that most of the things that we naturally would uh, give them the name of a sand dollar, we describe them as sand dollars based on their morphology, uh, do in fact form a, a group, a natural group of closely related forms that we can give them the name of true sand dollars here or just sand dollars for brevity. Uh, there's one other lineage here that's shown that re looks remarkably similar to all of the other sand dollars. That's nonetheless, not at all related to the other forms. And that was interesting to find, but it was to some extent already known. And this form that's shown here, highlighted with this yellow arrow, had always been classified within a group that's known as the sea biscuits. And sea biscuits share some traits with sand dollars. Not all of them look re that remarkably similar, but they do share a lot of traits in common. So based on that, it was always assumed that the two of them were each other closest relatives, that the sea biscuits and the sand dollars were very closely related to each other. And what our genome scale phylogenies taught, taught us for the first time is that there was this other third group of organisms known as the casiduloids that was in fact nested in between both of those uh, lineages. And to understand exactly why this was uh, surprising, we're going to look a little bit into the morphological evolution of these forms. And here I have the exact same phylogeny. Uh, I have just simplified it such that there's a single member of each one of these three main lineages, but the way in which these are interrelated are exactly the same as I showed you before. And you can instantly see that sand dollars and at least some sea biscuits look remarkably similar to each other, but beyond just their sort of overall level of morphological resemblance, they also share a number of unique traits that are exclusive to the two of them and that are not present among any form of casiduloids. For example, uh, both of the tests, which is the, the way we refer to the skeletons of sea urchins, the tests of these organisms are extremely flattened, while those of casiduloids are more globose, more, more similar to that of, for example, an average sea urchin. Sea biscuits and sand dollars also have this unique trait. Uh, you, we see these uh, internal reinforcements that run from one side of the test to the other side of the test. These columns and pillars of skeletal material that we see in both of these shells uh, or, or tests, like I said, of sea biscuits and sand dollars that have been cracked open to reveal them. That trait is not found among casiduloids. And for example, both of these forms also have teeth and jaws as adults, that star-like structure in the center of the test that we see in both of these. That's an internal feature. It has been revealed by chipping away and breaking the top part of the test of the organisms. The, those are the jaws, the jaw apparatus that maintains, provides support and mobility to the teeth of both sea biscuits and sand dollars. And casiduloids do have jaws and teeth as juveniles, but as adults, they all lose them. They're sort of 
uh, reabsorbed. And so before we had, before we developed the technology to sequence DNA material, more uh, phylogenies had to necessarily be inferred using exclusively morphological data. And based on all of these shared attributes of sea biscuits and sand dollars, those morphological phylogenies always assumed that they were each other's closest relatives, basically because all of those traits that I've just explained are more, are more easily to understand as, as, as things that arose only, one in, only once in evolutionary history, and that we see them today in these two different clades simply because they just inherited from their last common ancestor. But our genome scale phylogenies have taught us that this is not the correct way of conceptualizing the morphological evolution of these forms, and that it's actually more likely that at least some of these traits arose multiple times independently in the lineages that gave rise to the sea biscuits and the sand dollars. And this is quite surprising because it's not just one or two features, it's many features, and there are more that I have not introduced here uh, that sea biscuits and sand dollars shared exclusively. And to understand a little bit better why this process of, of sort of dramatic convergence between these two life forms, how that might have happened, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of morphological integration. And morphological integration is simply the tendency of different traits to vary in a coordinated, coordinated manner, such that the presence of one already implies also the presence of the other. And we think that, for example, two traits that I introduced before, the, 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 the flattened shapes that characterize both sand dollars and sea biscuits, and the presence of internal reinforcements that run through the inside of their tests, those are likely to be functionally linked such that the presence of one requires the presence of the other automatically. And here on the right, you can see a CT scan of uh, a sand dollar that has been cut open, digitally cut open um, longitudinally. So you, you're seeing the inside of the test more or less around halfway through the height of the organism. And you see those five sets of two uh, of pairs of columns of material that run from the underside of the organism to the, its top. Um, and you can see that those structures have a very high density of material. They're, they have a lot of skeletal, skeletal material that that's likely to provide a lot of reinforcement and structure and, and, and a capacity to bear loads to the test of these, of these organisms. And if we actually build models of these tests, and we see how much weight they can support with those reinforcements, with, with those internal reinforcements that are shown there. And without them, if we digitally remove those and see how much weight they can sustain after that, then we see that they play a crucial role in maintaining the sort of the stability of these uh, tests in their absence, uh, flattened tests like those of sand dollars and sea, and, and sea biscuits crack and collapse under much lower forces than when those uh, reinforcements are present. And this is a basic architectural principle that we see in many buildings where highly domed structures, as we see in the tops of churches and other buildings, uh, are able to maintain themselves without any sort of load bearing structure in the center, while flattened sort of roof like structures need a lot of columns in between for them not to collapse. And this is the exact same sort of architectural constraint that's playing out in the, in the tests of these organisms. And it teaches us that whenever an organism uh, suffers some sort of selective pressure to become flatter, then automatically it must develop these internal reinforcements for that structure to be stable. And we see this link between these two traits playing out across evolutionary history as well. And here, what I'm showing you is the phylogeny of all the major lineages of sea urchins. And what I'm mapping out in different colors is the presence in yellow or absence of these internal reinforcements, these columns and pillars that run through the inside of the test of these organisms. And you can see that those originated twice independently in the two lineages that become independently flatter. And those are the sand dollars and the sea biscuits. And not only that, not only they originate sim simultaneously in the, in the lineages that become flatter, but they were also lost in one lineage of sand dollars. And that lineage of sand dollars is also the one lineage that sort of deviated from this flatter 
body plan back into a more sort of egg-shaped globose test that's typical of all sea urchins. And with that sort of more rounded shape, they lost that necessity to have those internal reinforcements and those were concomitantly lost as well. So we see the link between these two traits, not only functionally, but also playing out across the evolutionary history of these forms. And therefore, it's not like we, don't, we, don't need, we do not need to explain their multiple origins of each one of those structures independently, which would require, which would be rather unlikely to have happened multiple times across different traits, uh, across different clades, but they're actually just a single suit of, of traits that has to sort of evolve all together and appear all together. And therefore, it reduces the number of evolutionary events that we need to explain that underlied probably the convergent evolution of sea biscuits and sand dollars. Our phylogeny also can teach us a lot about the times of origin of all of these forms. And so if we go back and look into the fossil record that they've left behind, we see that the sea biscuits originated in the Eocene, or that's at least the first record that we see of them in the fossil record some 47 million years ago. Sand dollars also seem to have originated around the same time, also in the Eocene, a little bit older, but broadly comparable first occurrences compared to those of the sea biscuits. While Cassiduloids are a much, much more ancient lineage, uh, probably as, uh, from the perspective of the fossil record at least, twice as old as uh, sand dollars and sea biscuits are. And they extend, they have a very good fossil record that extends all the way deep into the Cretaceous. And that's the time before the mass extinction uh, caused by the, by, the, uh, by the collide of the collision of the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs and introduced a lot of other major reorganizations of Earth's biosphere. So it's, uh, there's very good fossil evidence that Cassiduloids were present alongside dinosaurs in the Cretaceous. Well, there's no evidence that sea biscuits and sand dollars were present in those times. And in fact, the fossil record suggests that they originated after the, the collision with the, with the asteroid that induced the end Cretaceous mass extinction. However, our genome scale phylogeny tells us that both sand dollars and sea biscuits must have been present in the Cretaceous as well. And this is just based on the fact that this topology, whenever this is this is a constraint imposed by the process of biodiversification, what, which just shows, as you can see here in this tree, that whenever one lineage comes into existence, its sister group must also come into existence. That's just a natural way in which organisms by, uh, organisms diversify, and um, we refer to these periods of time where we know, for example, given the phylogenetic relationships that we infer for these forms. We know that those lineages must have been present, and yet we find no evidence of their existence in the fossil record. We, we refer to those uh, periods of time as ghost ranges. And what's really surprising about these is that sea biscuits and sand dollars have a fantastic fossil record. Like we've said before, they are organisms that are characterized by these re really robust skeletons that are that tend to not disintegrate easily after the organisms uh, die um, and they also have a lifestyle in which they spend most of their time at least many of the of, of the of the sand dollars and sea biscuits spend much of their time buried within the sediment and that's one other step that needs to happen for an organism an organism to enter the fossil record is for them to be buried by sediment organisms that already live buried to begin with have a much higher probability of being preserved in the fossil record. And so this extremely large fossil gap or ghost range that our phylogeny tells us is probably on the average of about 50 million years is extremely surprising and something that we would like to have some second opinion, some second confirmation that is an actual true pattern um, and an actual, uh, an actual something that actually happened in the evolutionary history of these forms. And thankfully, we have that second opinion uh, in the form of the molecular clock. And the molecular clock is a very simple observation that states that as two organisms have, have diverged a long, longer and longer time ago, so as, as, as time progresses since the last time that they shared a common ancestor, they will accumulate more and more differences from each other as they undergo independent evolutionary histories. And we can go and measure the, those differences 
both in their morphology, but most importantly in their genomes, which we can get very accurate uh, observations and measurements of the amount of differences between the genomes of different organisms. So we can measure those amounts of change, and we can also model the rate at which those changes have accumulated through time. And with those two sort of backtrack and back, back calculate the time since divergence between different life forms. And of course, of course, whenever we're modeling a complicated biological uh, process that spans uh, and, and uh, spans through millions and millions of years, there's a lot of sources of error, a lot of assumptions that go into it, a lot of um, simplifications of the actual process of evolution. And so these these analyses will not will never give us an extremely precise answer, but they will likely be a, a good attempt. At, at, they will provide a good attempt at constraining which ranges of times of origin of groups are likely and which other times are unlikely to be true. And so we could do that. And what, what I'm showing you here on the left, this phylogeny has been time scaled to geological time. And I'm simply we're simply sampling likely uh, histories of diversification of all of sea urchins. And we're recording here on, what we're recording here on the right is the ages of those two note, notes that I'm highlighting here in yellow and orange, and orange. And those are the notes of the most recent common ancestor of the sea biscuits and that of the most recent common ancestor of the sand dollars. And as you can see, like I said before, there's a lot of uncertainty as to when specifically in time those forms first originated. But even within that uncertainty, it's very clear that there's a strong evidence for those forms, for those clades being present and originating before the time of the strike of the, of the asteroid, before the end Cretaceous mass extinction, to the point that we can say that it's almost certainly true, uh, at least from, this, from the perspective of this analysis, that those forms originated a lot before they first appear in the fossil record. And this provides a second confirmation of that pattern that I mentioned before of an early origin of both sea biscuits and sand dollars deep in Cretaceous times, some 40 to 60 million years before their earliest fossil record. And exactly why we're missing so much of their evolution of their early evolutionary history is something that we're still trying to understand and figure out. But it's something that seems to be supported both from the perspective of the fossil record and from the perspective of uh, genomic data. And with that, I'm going to briefly conclude by saying that sandars are a prime example of biological innovation, where we see this unique body plan arising relatively rapidly and entailing the dramatic reorganization of the morphology of these organisms to the point that we give them a different name. We no longer call them sea urchins. Now they're, they're so different that they deserve their own name, the sand dollars. But also that this entirely new body plan arose not only once, but repeatedly across the diversification of sea urchins. And despite these changes being extremely radical, despite them meaning a deep reorganization of the anatomy of the organisms and how unlikely that it's to happen many times over and over again, uh, we can probably better conceptualize that evolutionary process by, by understanding how it was facilitated by morphological integration, where we're not dealing with the repeated origin of multiple independent traits, but a single, in, a single suit of traits that necessarily uh, appears and disappears all together as one in a coordinated manner. Despite our phylogeny shedding light into the morphology and at least some aspects of the morpholo morphological steps involved in the origin of this new body plan, it also tells us that we're likely missing the earliest stages of this evolutionary history, at least today. Maybe we'll find some, we'll, 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 we'll encounter some uh, fantastic new findings in the fossil record eventually. But as, to, as of today, both molecular clocks and the fossil record both agree that a lot of the earliest stages of this morphological evolutionary process are out of, of the reach of what we can observe directly because of the lack of fossils um, that we can sample from those specific time intervals. And with that, I would like to thank not just, uh, well, the Peabody Museum, not just for giving me this opportunity to share this research with all of you, but also for their support throughout all the years uh, in the research that I just shared with you involving uh, material from the collections deposited there. 
um, and also the funding sources that allowed for a lot of this research to happen. The many co-authors and advisors that I had along the way that uh, greatly contributed to all of the science. And for all the images that I did not take myself, they've been given um, by these people or from, I, would, I take them, them from the, these places and they deserve credit as well. And um, with that, thank you all so much. And we, I think we can have some time for questions. Great, thanks so much, Nicholas. Um, we do have some questions uh, who came that came in during your talk. Um, so one of them is a question from Bill, um, who asked, "How are crinoids related to sand dogs?" Um, so there's five major lineages of echinoderms. Um, that includes uh, the sea urchins, which includes the sandlers, as we've mentioned. Uh, starfish and brittle stars, uh, both of which have this sort of clear star-shaped structure to their bodies. Um, sea cucumbers, which are those elongated, sort of slimy, uh, soft body. Relative, yeah, they, they, ha they have re greatly reduced the amount of skeleton, skeleton that they have into tiny spicules, so they look more or less slimy and soft-bodied. And then there's the crinoids, which are the only of the five members of the echinoderms that are stocked. So uh, crinoids are sister to all four of the other lineages of echinoderms, living echinoderms. So um, yeah, so all of the other forms that are not stocked share a common ancestor and form the group that's the sister group to the crinoids. Okay. And then I remember you saying in the presentation, you had a photo of like the jaw yep. that was sort of a star shape. Mm -hmm. So do, and then there's the brittle stars and you said starfish that are also star-shaped. So do those other lineages also have a star-shaped something in there that we just can't see? Uh, a lot of starfish and brittle stars uh, uh, have a mechanism of digestion in which they just divert um, their stomach and uh, they digest food externally. And then they just consume sort of the digested food later. Um, so, so yeah, there's been a lot of evolution in terms of the uh, ways in which these different uh, lineages of the chinoderm uh, obtain and consume food, um, and they that sort of that sort of pentameral or fivefold symmetrically uh, distributed uh, set of teeth and jaw elements. Uh, and that's called an Aristotle's lantern is typical of sea urchins exclusively. This, yeah. Um, so the sister group of the sea urchins, which are the sea cucumbers, have a much more simplified um, structure around their mouth. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and the other forms have completely different forms of consuming food. Okay, gotcha. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, another question that came in here, um, if I'm walking along the beach as a tourist, how do I tell the difference between a sand dollar and a sea biscuit? Ah, that's interesting. Um, so those extremely flattened sea, uh, sea biscuits that I, that I showed you um, are typical exclusively of uh, waters in northern Australia. Uh, it's not something you would encounter here. Um, um, so sea biscuits, I'm not entirely sure there are any records of sea biscuits in uh, beaches in, in the US. So you probably, if you are in the US and you find uh, something that looks like a sand dollar or that's flattened and have all these features, then it's definitely a sand dollar. Uh, there's some sea biscuits in Florida, um, but they're mostly contained, constrained in the Americas to like warmer waters close to the Caribbean. So yeah, I, I need to take that back. So there are there are sea biscuits in Florida, for sure, uh, but those are a lot highly. Do uh, ha their their test is a lot higher. They're not as flat as the sea biscuits that I was using throughout this talk that are exclusive to like Australian waters. Okay, so kind of the answer is it depends on where you are, maybe. Yeah, it depends on where you are. If exactly. Those different groups occur there. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Um, Another, I'm, I, I can go a little bit more into it. If, uh, so most of the sand, most of the sand dollars, the, the true sand dollars, if you flip them around, 
you see this radiating sets of canals. I don't know if you've ever seen one, but if, uh, that sort of converge towards the mouth. And those are known as the food group, food groups. And they have this really intricate complex system that's known as a food group system uh, that is um, it re related to the unique mechanism with which they pick particles of organic matter from the sediments and they pass it along towards the mouth um, and so that sort of structure that looks like a tree that radiates from the center uh, of the test on the underside where the mouth is, uh, mm -hmm. that's something that's a lot more developed in sand dollars. The sea biscuits have something that's very, very simple, and it's just like lines coming out of their mouth. So whenever you have on the underside of something that's, uh, that you find on a, beach, on a beach that looks very flat, if that has some sort of radiating complex pattern, then that's definitely a sand dollar. Okay. Cool, thank you. Um, so multiple people ask different versions of this question. So I'm gonna try to combine them into one. Um, but basically um, the questions are all about the lack of sea biscuit and sand dollar fossils beyond or mm -hmm. further back in time from the 50 million year mark. And does yep. that reflect a lack of searching? Do you know why? Have people looked for them? Um, yes, no, people are have there places in the world that we think they might be found? Um, um, yeah. We don't have a very good answer um, so far as to why we're missing such, such a striking amount of time uh, if our analyses are correct. And there's also reason to believe that maybe our analyses aren't entirely correct. So um, nothing is set in stone. This is just sort of their, our, our most up-to-date um, version of what we think happened. But there's reason to believe maybe some of these analyses, uh, maybe some of the models that go into it are incorrect. Uh, so that, that can happen. Uh, I'm not gonna say that that's definitely not a possibility. But um, people have looked a lot into Cretaceous rec into Cretaceous uh, sediments and there's a very good fossil record in the Cretaceous for most other forms of um, sea urchins. No reason why to believe is specifically these forms will be lacking. Um, there's uh, there's reasons why forms go in and out of the fossil record that has to do with their ecology, with where they're living, whether they're actually living in environments that lead to uh, facilitate their incorporation into the fossil record. So some drastic changes in their ecology uh, that happened deep time, uh, deep time ago um, that, might have, that might have some influence into why we don't see them. Uh, but it's definitely not because of a lack of effort by paleontologists to find them. Um, and there has been some preliminary records of some teeth elements from the Cretaceous that look kind of like similar to a sand dollar but it's just an isolated teeth. Um, and the reason why we would see such a, such a small footprint of them in the Cretaceous in the forms of just like a few disarticulated tooth elements and why, uh, uh, why starting from the Eocene, we have this fantastic record of entire tests is something that's entirely unclear, not just to me, but pretty much to everyone else. Okay, so a mystery is still yet to yes, be. We'll work hard on it, but yeah, so far okay. it's just a mystery. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one last question that I have here for you. Um, do we have any idea about the genetic controls on building columns within echinoids? Um, so that is to say the support structures within sand dollars. Um, and is there anything similar in other sea urchins? Um, that's interesting. Um, I, I'm not aware of any research on the de developmental control of um, specifically that aspect of skeletogenesis, the generation of skeletons in sea urchins. There's a lot that we know about the, 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 ge the genetic, um, the, the genes and their relative uh, control over each other uh, that induce cascades of skeletonization, for example, but I haven't seen any research that tackles specifically why um, or how those, those internal structures uh, are built. So um, yeah, but in general, sea urchins have always been studied from a developmental perspective a lot more than other groups. So there's a lot of vast resources and a lot of information that's 
generally known about the developmental controls of many aspects of their way their, but their body is built. Um, and there's probably a lot of opportunities to use all of that information to tackle this specific convergent uh, evolution of this trait that I don't think has happened yet. And there's, I should say that there's one other group of extinct uh, sea urchins that also has uh, those structures. They're very different, a lot simpler, um, but there's one extinct group that's not flat that has those structures. And it's likely that in them, it did not serve that much a role in uh, stability or, or structural um, uh, providing some, some robustness to, to their overall test and the structure. Um, maybe it played a different role. Maybe it's just sometimes it, it was, it's always also been suggested that they may play, play a role in weights in, in, in increasing the weight of the organisms so that they're more difficult, for example, to be picked up or, or to tumble around by currents. And in these other forms that are extinct, uh, it's difficult to say exactly what role do they play because we can't see them in their natural environments anymore. They're all extinct, but maybe they played a role, for example, in becoming just uh, increasing their weight and not necessarily in, in, in bearing forces as they do in sand dollars and sea biscuits. Well, thank you so much. I think this about brings us to the end of our time today. Unfortunately, we had a lot of questions from the audience today. Everybody was really stoked about sea biscuits. So thank you guys so much um, for attending today's talk and so much for all of your wonderful questions. Um, if you enjoyed this talk today, please look out for the next speaker in this series, uh, Alejandro Damian Serrano who is also an evolutionary biologist who recently graduated from the ecology and evolutionary biology department at Yale. And he will be discussing his research on the evolution of siphonophores, which are also an ocean creature um, relative of jellyfish. And that talk is taking place on December 2nd. Um, if you like talks like this in general that you can view online from the Peabody, Please do follow us on social media. We have various social media pages or you can stay in touch by signing up for our mailing list at the bottom of the Peabody website. We'd really like to make sure that you know about all of our upcoming programs online so that you can take part in them if you so wish to. And thank you again today, Nicolas. It was such an interesting talk and just a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Megan, and thanks, thanks everyone. Yep. So again, thank you all for attending and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your Thursday.